now I want to come right in to the contemporary world and uh, introduce you to a volume that is very impressive because it happens to be absolutely accurate. And this volume, volume it has, uh, brings back a lot of unpleasant memories for me because I lived many of these events when they happened. The volume is called When Open Orthodoxy is Not Orthodox. It's by David Rosenthal. I gathered that David Rosenthal uh, is a graduate of Ney Israel. Ney Israel is uh, the closest that you have to uh, land the college, I would say, is Ney Israel. A little, you know, and they're both close to YU, although YU is more to the left in the sense it's a more open curriculum. Land the College is more limited, as we've spoken about. And Ney Yisrael, they have arrangements with Johns Hopkins. It seems to me every Ney Yisrael graduate goes to college, 80% of them become lawyers. They translate, you know, the Gemara. The Gemara comes like a Dershowitz now. My vart yesterday, uh, it's not a bad vart that I said. You don't know what uh, I'm getting from America. Everyone's studying what's going on. But Dershowitz shocked them. A president can do whatever he wants to remain in power. So you know what I said yesterday? It's a miracle he didn't say, Morid Mamalchut Chayav Mita. Could you imagine? <coughs> he would quote the Gemara and say, Gentlemen, there's a source in the Talmud that a king immediately executes anyone who differs with him. The president has the right. Morid Mamalchut Chayav Mita. This... Um, the, uh, the Gemara that he learned is still within him. And uh, it seems to me that in Baltimore, some of the graduates become medical doctors, but they have this arrangement with Johns Hopkins. But you know, I, I so far don't see too many professors of English literature, of, 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 of Chinese literature coming out of uh, uh, near Israel and Johns Hopkins. But from YU, anything is possible. Uh, these are, all right, now... In what happened was the, uh, you might want to call it the slippery slope, if I'm pronouncing it correct. Last week I said the slopery slip. And I think the slopery slip sounds better, but I'll try to say it correctly. But correct me if I fall back into my own word. Uh, the slopery slip, you see, what begins with Jaffa, what begins with, uh, uh, what begun with, with Ada, which Rabbi Saul Berman, my classmate, who I spoke about at the OU Center. So ultimately, you have Rabbi Avi Weiss, who, again, these are people I know personally and tremendous affection for them. But Avi, Rabbi Avi Weiss, I don't have to tell you, we wind up now with a Chovevei Torah. We wind up for, with a a yesh, he calls it a seminary, I think. I don't, I don't think they called it a yeshiva for women as well, or maybe they do call it a yeshiva. And uh, more than that, their students, their comments, uh, you go one by one. And what's amazing about this book is every comment he quotes, he gives you the source. You can hear it. It's either an article or it's recorded on the internet. Now, I've raised issues years ago already. I... I have many students, uh, you know, in the course of life you have, I have from the Eid Haredit to Chovevei Torah and beyond. And uh, so I have students in Chovevei Torah, I've raised issues, they double talk me. Ultimately, they'll tell you, well, this is not the official policy of the institution. But I will always answer, why you, Ms. Machen, don't speak this way. In other words, it may not be the official policy, but you go one by one by one by one by one, and before you know it, you have 30, 40 quotes which go way beyond, or halacha lamaisa, show you where it all begins. If there's a rabbinic will, there is a halachic way. Now, one of the issues that came up in... Uh, uh, who, who are you looking for? You're welcome, welcome, sit down, sit down. Uh, one of the issues, one of the issues that came up in Chovevei uh, Torah is, is biblical criticism. Biblical criticism, I've told you more than once, uh, I 
had the privilege of knowing uh, Professor Yeshaya Leibowitz and knowing uh, Nechama Leibowitz very close. We taught together many, many years, decades. And uh, Nechama once said to me, I differ with my brother on many topics, but on one topic we're totally in agreement. Biblical criticism is sheer anti-Semitism. And uh, if you'll notice Nechama's lectures, her published writings, she will never give credence to biblical criticism. She will quote non-Jews. She will try to understand the word, a concept, the ancient language, but she will not give credence to biblical criticism. Here you have a Rabbi Zeb Farber, a yeshiva Chovevei Torah graduate, 2006, and quote, I quote, the simplest explanation for these differences between the accounts in Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is that they were penned by at least two different authors with different conceptions of the desert experience. Okay, and here you have the opening key to biblical criticism. Have any of you ever studied the holiness code, the different authors, the differences between the uh, Leviticus, uh, uh, Rabbi Rubin, with the uh, Professor Zeitlin, did he touch upon this? Where did he stand? He didn't touch biblical. Did we go with Talmud? Talmud. So, so you should know that Louis Ginsburg, who I, I don't have to tell you, Louis Ginsburg was the Vilna Gaon's great 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 nephew, was a Gaon, our dear photographic memory, tells Yeshiva boy, ah, the stories about him in his youth. Remember, I told you his mother came to visit him during a Sarat, during Chaydeshello. She, he wouldn't talk to her, remember? He was in a tiny deep or his mother comes to visit. So you should know, at a certain point in his life, he did follow biblical criticism. Later in life, he regretted it. If you read his biography his, by his son, so uh, you'll see that there was a shift later. It's interesting, Zeitlin too, they were able to engage in Talmudic criticism, but not biblical <laughs> And here, all right, this is one quote, not the end of the world. Here's one of their famous graduates, Choveve uh, Torah 2010, Rabbi Shmuel Yanklovich. Remember, I checked out if he's related to my Rebbe, Reb Geshen Yanklovich, a Shanghai survivor, Zechat Sadik Levracha. So I was told, no, he has a, similar, a very similar name, it is the same name, Yanklovich, but they're not related. And, uh, my teacher, Rabbi Dr. Nathan Lopez Cardoza. Now, you know, right away, my teacher, Dr. Nathan Lopez Cardoza, right? This is someone I know very well. And, and this is one of the stories when you, when, when you were educated in the Haredi world and uh, you leave the past, there's anger. Uh, I saw it with Pez Cardoso, I saw it with Devi Hartman. Remember, Devi Hartman is why you only get one quarter of the blame for Devi Hartman. Elementary school Chabad, high school Chaim Berlin, the real influence, Lakewood, Rebarin Cutler. That's how I wound up in Lakewood. It's really, I have to be honest with you. I read Washington, I tell the truth. Devi Hartman, what an influence on me. Again, it's a different lifetime. I remember when the Chazonish died, I described this in Washington, the Chazonish died, he came into the base, Medrash, hysterical, rip Kriya and sit down on the floor. And we said, Duvi, what happened? Chazonish died, all right. This shows you where Duvi was at, and I don't say I ripped Kriya, but we sure sat down on the floor. And, uh, and, and, but there was a certain bitterness there. I've met people who went off the path from YU. There's no bitterness. That, 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 that I'm not happy with them, I'm not happy. That I told them off, I told them off. That they cried when I spoke. This is recent, but past too. Ach, Rafa Kefid, you opened our hearts again. You opened our hearts again. You reminded me of my days in Yeshiva. Then I met their wives. I understood already where they're at in life. But... Uh, here, the, uh, 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 Lopez Cardoza, there's a certain bitterness, bitterness. My teacher, Rabbi Dr. Nathan Lopez Cardoza, once again hits a grand slam. 
A grand slam, he's missing one word here, a grand slam home run, Yitzchak, you understand? Reminding us to get our priorities straight as we approach Tishabov. And then he quotes his Rebbe. Whether or not the temple will be rebuilt is not our concern, nor is it our dream. It is of little importance. What we dream of is the day when we will be able to transform ourselves and reconstruct the temple's message within our hearts. Yitzchak, what does that remind you of? Word by word, 1885. Word. Give it to me. Pittsburgh word. platform. Exactly. Exactly. Replain a shalom. But I know Rabbi L L Lopez Cardoza. <laughs> he came out a few years ago with a whole article. We have to reconstruct Chazal. That the, the way we pass. Can you understand? Again, I haven't wasted my time since 1978 on. I have not re repeated a sham the call of gentlemen on Sunday. It's the real McCoy. Today you're just hearing jokes. Sunday shots, Paiskin and Shalip and Shuvit. It's the world. Yesterday you should have been here. Today you come to hear the jokes. I don't think that's nice. But anyway, be it as it may, uh, he wanted the whole halachic system. Of course, when you Mori you Rebbe of Salavet, you time and again. You learn Beit Shammai, Beit Hillel, Abai and Rava, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, it's the same schad, the same Torah Shabbat prayer. But if you paskin against the maskan of the Gemara, you're an apikairis, plain and simple. Listen to what I just said. Look at the Rambam, Hakdama to Mishnah Torah. If you don't know the Hakdama of the Mishnah Torah by heart, you're going to be in Amoritz all your life. Without understanding that Hakdama, you don't know how to breathe there. And, and that's the secret of Hidgapshut, of crystallization, of the whole halachic process. It's, it's what, no, Lopez Kadosa comes out, we have to repaskin, we have to rechange, we're going to attract the you. Replenish your life. If you, it makes a big difference to the kid growing up in Hoda Sharon or the kid growing up in North Tel Aviv, whether we paskin like Beit Hillel or Beit Shammai, or like Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Abaya, or Rabbi, Gaitaman and Levin, you understand? But uh, this is Lopez Kadosa, but this is very, very frightening. See, a hundred percent. His wife wears a shaitel and he says sh Shom is Shabbos and he's Shem a hundred percent. But he's also angry at the Rav. He never met the Rav. I don't believe he ever met the Rav. He's too young to have ever met the Rav and he grew up in, in, in London in Gateshead from a different world. Holland. I don't know. He studied in Gateshead, I believe. From Gateshead he came to Israel. I don't know if he studied in Mir or Hebron, Panovich here. But... Uh, he never met the Rav, but he reads the Rav like that's what I told you a few months already when I hit upon this topic in the history of Torah in the United States. The Rav wet their appetite. Remember you said to me, Rebbe, why are you so upset to give these lectures? Because I have to use wet. This is what new? I read to you, Rabbi Rackman. What words did he use? The Rav wet our appetite. But there's a border. There's Torah. This is the challenge that we all face. A ger, a ger a chassid, uh, we, you all know my, re, my joy in it, became a medical doctor, the story of this kid. You, you, I'm, uh, Mark, you were not here, you were in Teaneck. God, why do people have to run around and make money already? At your age, you should say to your wife, Ad Khan, and move to Yerushalayim like Morty did with his wife, and get in all the good Sheurim. And then you'll say to Abba Branspiegel, your Rebbe, my Chavir, I, wow, I turned my life into a golden path. But, wow, wow, wow. What did I start to say uh, before I, I gave Musa? Uh, what, 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 what? Lopez Cardoza, Charlie, what was the connecting link? Lopez Cardoza and I... Yeah, yeah. So you see, that's the question. What can you take? What can't you take? All right, let, now watch. Y Yitzchak, what did you want to say? No, I wanted to ask if, uh, if he was a full Jew. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Orthoprax, a hundred percent. Then you have here, I'm going page by page. Uh, this book is well documented. 
Rabbi Yosef Kinevsky. Oh, God. Can you tell me who Rabbi Yosef Kinevsky is? Talmud of Aaron Rakefet, right here in this kollel. Early 80s. Rabbi David Miller, Zalazan Gesund, the Rosh Kollel, he never met Rabbi. Why? He was in America. He was in Cleveland. If, I, if I, my memory is correct, you have to take with Rabbi David. He went to America for one or two years. His wife had to get a master's, whatever it was. So he never met Rabbi Kanevsky. He said, Jay yeah, was in the Kollel. He was in the Kollel. Very bright individual. Tremendous career in the Rabbinate out in Los Angeles. I, re I remember this quote when it happened that I almost had a conniption. And often, he's talking about women, and often she must content herself with davening in a cage in shoe from where her desire to say Kaddish for a parent may or may not be tolerated. Etty, I want to ask you a question. In your father's shoe, did you daven in a cage or behind the mechitza? They tell me what there was. There was a seating without a method. So when they moved into the new shul, my father almost didn't go. Uh, the original shul had a balcony. The original shul had a balcony. It's very, very hush of a family. The, uh, the Rosenzweig, if you know, uh, one of the great Gonim that while you turned out, that's her first cousin, that young lady's first cousin. So, so did you sit in the cage? When you went to Jack's shul in, in, in Toronto, uh, the fancy shul, was there a cage for women? There was a balcony. A balcony. A balcony. Read, how can you write this? this uh, it's beyond my comprehension. But this is one of the big supporters, and he slapped, this face was slapped in uh, Los Angeles by my own Talmud when I criticized it. Oh, my God. Rabbi Zev Farmer, now we're dealing with homosexuality. I believe we must come to terms with the fact that in the long run, orthodox homosexual Jews really have no choice but to allow themselves to fulfill the intense desire for emotional and physical intimacy in the only way open to them. <sighs> My dear students, let me talk about homosexuality, lesbianism. I've lived, I'm a Nimodala Kaddish Baruch Hu, 61 years of teaching Torah. I've been in the thick of it, wow. Tens of, I've, Torah, I mean, you know how much I've taught. The classroom, at least <coughs> over 11,000. The Israeli army, you can't, thousands upon thousands. Russia behind the Iron Curtain. Australia, South Africa, Canada, coast to coast, America. It was the younger ones. Uh, of course you come across homosexuality. You know when it's inborn, go online and check all the research. Animal kingdom, humans. It's less than 2% of the population where it's inborn, where there's really a problem. Generally speaking, I've had about five problems in my years of teaching, maybe six. Five and a half were certainly psychological, emotional, nothing to do with an inborn trait. You want an example? It's very simple. And I can use the name because the New York Times, they went public when the uh, Yudhiya Dachronot came up with the story. They didn't use names. 10, 10, 15 years later, the New York Times, the girl allowed her name to be used. One of the greatest tragedies that I have been part of, Malka and I, in our life. When we went to Russia and came back the first time, we were shell-shocked. And in addition to starting to work for the Mossad from that point, I helped organize Shvetami. Shvetami, outreach to Russians, outreach in the Russian language, etc. A long history of what Shvetami accomplished, publications in Russian. I, I myself uh, published in Russian, Cold Odido Fake, the Rub's masterpiece, Al Hatshuva, the Rub's masterpiece on Yom Narayim. We published endless volumes. All right, it's the literature work. Excuse me? They published in Russian every 
Elliot Bird, there's an, no end. But this Shvetami itself, I mean, this we distribute, Shvetami, we publish endless volumes. Rabbi Norman Lamb, Hedge of Roses, we published that. That was a bestseller. We, had, we went through five different printings. And um, one of the families that I bonded with in America, it was a very, very famous name. The Cow family, K A B, Cab Cow. Recognize the name? And uh, if you're a Chabadnik, you'll recognize the name. Zeshtan from Chabadnikim Dore Doret. The great, great, great grandfather was the Rebbe's Shaliach in Minsk. And like everything else, they became assimilated in America, and the next generation came back. And that's the tragic story. They turned to Rabbi Riskin, they enrolled their kids in day school, and they asked him to send a tutor. And that tutor, she was a young lady, Sarah, 13, 14 years old, statutory rape. She confided in her sister, Lori, who later becomes a dear student of mine, of what was happening to her. Now, what are the results 40 years later? Sarah left religion, married a guy first time around. I don't know what happened second time around. You can understand that. The older sister became a lesbian. Tell me, and she's today the head of the so-called Orthodox lesbians, and she's a Shemerit Shabbat 100%. Tell me, is that inborn, or is that a result of life experience? So you see, you're dealing here with a terrible challenge, and... There's, in my humble opinion, only one approach, and that approach is we have to accept the sinner, but we cannot make the sin normative. And once you make the sin normative, <coughs> endless people jump out of the closet. Yotzim in Haron, be a written to Beret. Why? They have problems, psychological, financial, emotional. God have mercy. And here you take this attitude, Rabbi Zeb Faber, and you give it a, a credence of normalcy, normative behavior. Look what happened in Israel a few weeks ago when one of the Maftal people, what formerly was Maftal, Rabbi Peretz, who is only a, 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 I want to say, a brigadier general in the army, he was the chief rabbi, he was a helicopter pilot, you know what we're talking about. And they asked him, uh, how would you feel if your children were homosexuals or lesbians? And he said, I raised my children in a normal fashion. And was he attacked here by the liberals, by the leftists? You might say that he declared every homosexual, you should take him out and stone him and kill him and shoot him and destroy him. God, he only said, I raised my children, Baruch Hashem, in a normative fashion. This is an unbelievable challenge. And when you start speaking, uh, it's inborn. They can't help themselves. Well, you talk about inborn. Some people are inborn with terrible tempers. Rebind Shalom. Do I have to tell you anything further about my Rebbe? Where he talks about himself? We saw what in the, in the 50s, his temper. He, they, and they say in the 50s already was better than in the 40s. And, and Dove is looking at me, he doesn't know what I'm talking about. He studied with the Rav in the 70s. The Rav already was a Zaydi. Was, 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 they let the, the old time Tamitim, his own son, in the movie, I, in the, the, that was privileged to bring it to the world, the Dr. Mithi on the Rav, his own son, Rav Chaim, my classmate, said, since when does my father tolerate such nonsense. Some kids said a svar, if he would have said that svar in the 50s, the rub would have chopped his head off. In the 70s, no, no, you follow me though? You're born with a temper. My father had quite a temper. I worked very hard. You can cure things. All right, I don't want to go further. But when you make it normative, no one is interested in curing anything. 
you have to not only accept me, validate me. How dare you say this is not normative? Two men, two women, you know what they have in Tel Aviv? In some of the Ganei Yeladim, Ima Shel Shabbat, Abba Shel Shabbat, one of my great grandsons a few weeks ago was Abba Shel Shabbat. He called me so excited. Can I inherit in Yerushalayim? In Tel Aviv, you have two girls. One is the mother, father, whatever they call them. Next week, two men. The third week, a man and a woman. We got to teach this Rabbi Peretz or this moron Rakefet. You don't know what life is about. Bigoted. God have mercy. It's the end of the world. You understand? Why was there a flood? Look into Chazal. Decadent behavior like this. And here you see Rabbi Zephon. Not enough. Rabbi Dov Linsa. The Rosh Yeshiva's first cousin was one of my greatest Talmudim in the Kolon in the 80s. Rabbi Dov Linsa, Talmud Chacham, they tell me, from a wonderful family. This is one of the most challenging religious and halachic questions that we are facing today. And I think that our focus has to be non-halacha, but on communal acceptance and on making gay men and women and their spouses or partners as well as their children fully welcome and fully part of our communities, synagogues, and schools. All right, if we go with that approach, we're undermining the human race. Don't want to say a word about what's happening in China, but if any of you have ever visited China, Shamir Achim, on every street corner, Eva Min Hachai. Have you seen it? All right, let's not say another word. Let's hope we're totally incorrect. But Rebani uh, Shalalim brings a maka to the world. You have to sit down and be chayzeh b'tshuva. Look into the Rambam, chayzeh look into the Gemara. It's Mesachet Taimit, look at the Shoshana. Rabbi Yisachet Katz, Chair of the Department of Talmud and Director of the Lindenbaum Center for Halachic Studies at Yeshivat Chobah Bey Torah. And this Rabbi Yisrach HaKatz, I'm told, knew you know anything about him, Yitzchak? You didn't read his biography? He's a big Talmud Chachman, a Satma, his uncle was Satma of Ah, oh, what, what he comes from, yeah? The Torah makes clear that relations between two men is prohibited. But I'd like to talk about the 50 shades of, of gay. In other words, there are many other things they can do that are not expressly prohibitive. And I, very sad. Another quote about the Kohen from Rabbi Yisachar Katz. They shall not marry a prostitute or a woman has been defiled, neither shall they marry a woman divorced from her husband, for the priest is holy to his God. And he goes on, how can we ostracize these women? Why do we call them a prostitute? Why do we call them a zona? The fact that these divorcees are sometimes our sisters, moms, daughters, or ourselves, he's divorced, I understand, makes the insult all the more painful. Eili, Eili, lama azaftani. And I have to tell you, and I've said this a thousand times over the last 61 years of teaching Torah, the word zona in the context of the priestly prohibition has nothing to do with prostitution. A zona is a chalei shem of a woman who lived with a non-Jew, with a Gentile. That's all. Zona doesn't mean a prostitute in that sense. But a Kohen who represents sanctity and Kedusha has these prohibitions that he cannot live with these type of women. It's his Kedusha. But it's not an affront to the woman that we're putting her down because she happens to be a divorcee or with the Balat Shuvah, 
how many shilas we have, how much has been asked, written, spoken about. You're a rabbi in America. You have bala tshuv in your kahila. They become from. Chabad picks them up in college, after college. They become from perhaps a hundred different ways when they're more mature. And then they're marrying and you're filling in the ketuvah. And here you have a Kohen, and this girl was in a normal college campus. I don't want to mouth it with my lips what the Shiler is, but you can be practically absolutely certain she was with non-Jews. No, you ever think of that, Dove? No wonder you ran away from the rabbit. <laughs> but th- th- this, all right, Lomach Zikini Sura, we try our best. But let me go further. You, you'll see one by one by one what we're up against, what has happened, what the struggle is, what the challenge is. And uh, there's no black and white solution. Each one of us. And they, he quotes Chovavay, the faculty, the students. No, he doesn't go into uh, Dubi, but it's very, very fascinating. Here in 2011, I'm beginning on page 170, uh, Rabbi Sarah Horowitz, this is one of the early graduates, was interviewed by Reform Rabbi Mark Gollop on Shalom TV. <clears throat> now, what is Shalom TV? I would imagine it's a cable... Uh, am I right? Okay, Josh says I'm right. <coughs> a cable TV that centers on Jewish topics. Do we have on YouTube too? Probably watch episodes on YouTube too. What, what, what? I watch episodes sometimes on YouTube as well. Okay. YouTube is, everything is on YouTube. I don't watch television. If everyone is, there was a terrific three-part series here on the Hasidic world. Did you see it, Yitzchak? I it's on YouTube. I tried. It's called No, no, no. That's on Borough Park 20 years ago. That's oh. a different. No, no, no. This is Israeli television. Um, oh, it's on. Type in bells. Go to Google. Go to Haravagon Google and type in bells and see what you come up with. Anyway, it's just done. Well, a three. What, what's it called? Malkiyot Shemata. I told the class, I tell you, it's worth watching. It is so powerful, so sensitive, so insightful. And uh, you can get everything on YouTube. YouTube is a gift to the world. Type in the Lubavitcher Rebbe and you have to take off seven years to watch everything that will come up on, on the Rebbe. And uh, people tell me, they see my Sherman youth, I say, what are you talking about? So it seems uh, like the OU share, people ask me, can they record me? I said, you can record me. I said, I'm responsible for every word I say. You can record me, whatever you want. I didn't realize they meant they're not just recording me. Like yesterday, they videoed me. And then they put it up on YouTube. To watch I don't have time to waste. But to watch on, on it was beautifully done. Uh, okay. Now, so this lady is interviewed. Now, I want to tell you something. These women are very spiritual and very sensitive. They're not to be laughed at. Our problem is that Halavai the Rav would be here and they could hear the Rav teach. It would have an impact. But the Rav is not here. The Lubavitcher Rebbe is not here. These are very sensitive people. I, I don't want... But... In their minds already, they've, they don't realize they've crossed the border. And they've been influenced, the woman in a cage. And uh, here, the person interviewing him, interviewing her, uh, says to her, you are championing the cause of women, but you claim you're orthodox. You haven't gone far enough. Why not join the reformer conservative movement where women are completely equal members of the rabbinate? And uh, the Sarah Horowitz answers, she says she loves the orthodox community, she's a traditionalist, and then she comments, 
I take halacha very seriously. I grapple with it. I struggle with it. But I don't negate it. And I don't want to get rid of it. And I think that if halacha does change to allow women to be on a baton, it's not going to be Sarah Horowitz making that change. It's going to take many more years of serious thought and chuvat response written by those who are even more great in learning, gedolim in learning than we are, and they will be able to make these changes. So you see, you, you hear these words, this is a reflection of Rabbi Rackman's thinking. It's a reflection of Blue Greenberg. Ultimately, when there's a rabbinic will, there will be a halachic way. May I quote the Rav to you again? When we come up against the halachic wall, we just have to turn away and start all over again. There is no way in the world that we can be matter according to a giyoret, according to a krusha. Rabbi Hartman, his latest book put out by his students, recordings, the Kohen comes to him in Montreal, Rabbi, I'm in love, marrying, thank God, but she's a grusha. Will you perform the wedding? Personal happiness comes before the halacha. Not only will I perform the wedding, Devi says, take every Kohen who wants to marry a grusha or a convert, and I'll be happy to perform the wedding. Well, is it a divine system or isn't it? If halach is divine, if there's Kabbalah to Om Al-Chut Shemayim, if there's Matan Torah, Maimed HaSinai, Naseh Nishma, we are limited. We can be the greatest minds in the world, but Shabbat is Shabbat, Kashrit is Kashrit, Tarat HaMishpacha, family purity, family lineage, has to remain pure, Torahic. God have mercy when we start to crack the wall. And this is what I explained to Yitzchak yesterday. When you get involved, what Rabbi Rachman quotes, uh, the Malamad Lahoyal, Rabbi David Tzvi Hoffman, it's not that he found the solution to a Kohen, to a Giyoret. It was under the circumstances he told them how to minimize the prohibition. You have to read the Tshuva. Not to marry, to get married civilly, not halachically. And that takes us into the whole question. Uh, look, this problem comes up time and time again. I know the Rav had it many times, and in the Rabnet, I saw it, I felt it, I've been asked. People marry, live happily. Suddenly, midlife, they hear a rabbi speak, their whole life changes. All right, I can give you living examples. Abe Levavit, Seichet Sadek Levracha. Abe told me this, these years heard it from Abe. He was a businessman. It's Rabbi Ruchim Levavitz's nephew. It's Rabbi Moshe Feinstein's nephew. Abe Levavitz. His father was a Rav in Brooklyn. He gave me the million dollars to put out the uh, lonely man of faith. I, I've told you more than once. I'm greatly in debt to him. He did Sadek. And he told me in the 60s, he heard the Rav speak. Heard the Rav speak. And he came home and he told his wife, that's it, honey, we're moving from Jersey to Massachusetts, to Boston. I want to be near this man. I want to be near this man. And he became, you know, he's a very wealthy guy. He was a businessman. I was told that in Boston there wasn't a big business deal that he wasn't involved with. But his time was his own. He drove the rub around. He recorded the rub. And, and this happens in life. So when it, what happens with Abe Levovitz, you don't have a problem. But what do you do when it's a Kohen married to a Giyorit, a Kohen married to a Grusha? And later in life, they become Balei Tshuva. There were many problems. By the way, in Tinek, there were problems like this. They went to the Rav. The Rav told them to accept the children, educate the children. Children Chalalim never told the husband and wife to get divorced. You follow? It's a certain reality, halachically, Yes, uh, I had the problem in Maplewood. Don't ask what I had as a youngster. Today I have a little seichel. I'm older. Ellie, we're going to buy him a 
clock that has the magic alarm in it. Oh my gosh. Oh, to miss a shield like this and not to be able to tell it over to your grandfather and get involved. He might agree with me or might beat the heck out of me, but it'd be a lot of fun coming back here. These are real serious problems. The line, the wall, the surrender, Naseven Nishma. And this is the heart of the problem. And it goes on and on. And what she says is beautiful. She takes halachi seriously. I grapple with it. But she's waiting for the rabbis to come along. There's no way they're going to be able to work out a solution. This is a, a halacha in the Torah, period. The Malamad Lahoel, yes, Rabbi Gurin quoted the Malamad Lahoel. What's interesting is, and I lived it because I was here, and I knew what was going on in America, and many uh, Holzers, they kept me, they kept me informed, Rabbi Holzer, the Rub's right hand in New York, and the Rub, he was hysterical. I have it on tape at the Yarche Kala. And uh, they tell me, a, a, a rabbi, I think I quoted in, 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 in the Rav, in my work, and, and they tell me a rabbi in Israel uh, said he has a source, there's a responsum to permit a Kohen to marry a Giorat, he says. Impossible. Rabbi Meisha Feinstein, they told the same thing. He said, can't be. Impossible. I don't have the Malamad Lama Rabbi Meisha's true. He said, Hasef Hazani Tachet Yadi. But he wouldn't even look at that. What was the big deal? All he had to send was his Reb David or Reb Reuven around the corner to us from the Yankala Goldman, Yankala, the Tatavil Zanam, Alamad Lahoyal. In one minute, Reb Moshe would have had it. He didn't want to look at it. It can't be. It can't be. All right. These are, these are questions where you, a rabbi has to evaluate. I had it in Maple. That's when I started to tell you how did Beth Ephraim come to be? Do you know the story? The story is very simple. This was an area, suburban Essex County, totally reformed, conservative, the biggest reformed temples, the biggest conservative temples in the world, the most famous non-rabbi rabbis were in Essex County. So every kid who grew up in Newark became reformed, conservative today. The only ones that are still Jewish are those that are Sameach picked up, Chabad picked up. I can tell you stories. Outside of that, they're, they're not even Jewish today, the fourth, fifth generation, Guts Allah Pitten. So, how suddenly you have a, 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 you want to build an Orthodox shul? So, there was a medical doctor who, and it was public knowledge. Uh, his father was a shaykhet, a yidat tzaddik, but the kids were Americanish a kinder of that period, the 1910s, the 1920s. And uh, this medical doctor married a giyoret, and he was a kohen, broke his father's heart. Midlife, the son woke up, became a bal tshuva, a shayma shabbos, 100%, shayma kashrit, he, his brother, <clears throat> and they want to build the shul, and they turn to YU, and YU sends a guy named Rothkopf, and they build the first Orthodox shul suburban Essex County. Shul thrives today. Can I inhara a mikveh? I showed you a mikveh, state of the art mikveh, Erev, etc. No, he was a Kohen married to a Giyaret. Yitzchak. This man is the president. This man built the shul. This man raises the money. Can he do it? What I went through. God salap it. And the politics, the balabantim, you know, not so much l'shem shemayim, but to give him a, a kvetch a little bit. Of course he can't do it. Was I caught in the quagmire? But there's no solution. Personal happiness is wonderful as long as it doesn't conflict with the Baha Hashem Zu Halacha. Did you ask the Rav? Uh, <coughs> no, there's not to ask the Rav. Duchen, he couldn't Duchen. The question was how to do it in a way that wouldn't offend him too much. Uh, I, I'll tell you who I worked with. His original rabbi, Zeb Siegel. Got it? So we worked quite. 
It was a very unhappy situation. Thank God, Duchening in Chutz Laritz only takes place uh, f- f- a few times a year. Shlosh Shlosh Golem and Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Here in Israel, I need not tell you, Baruch Hashem and Yudushalayim every day. Do I rush? I always finish Monet, the Salinch Monesrei one second before the coin starts. The Bracha Baruch Hashem. Be ahava. Underline the word ahava. Right, God, you got you. You remind me in my shoe. Oh, Rifka, a guy came in Aliyah from America. Why wow, you graduate out of the forties? Big Londons, kids all in Lakewood. But if they ever said a bad word about the Rav, he'd beat the heck out of them. And this guy got involved in Machlaikis. I don't know what it was in the shoe. Old time shoe Jews, Machlaikis. And uh, he's uh, he's but uh, Ahava Bichat Kahanim. His name was Kohn Zichrona Levracha. And one of the Balabatim says to him, "You cannot allow Levareich because you don't have Ahava. You follow the Ahava." And by the way, a lot has been written on that. If a coin does Taka has a feeling, uh, he, uh, he has to inculcate a feeling of Ahava. And here she goes further. And um, uh, Rabbi Golub comments that many, this is the Reform Rabbi interviewing her, that many Orthodox Jews in Israel find it offensive <laughs> that some women wear tefillin at the Western world. Horowitz responds, you know, power is knowledge and there is no halacha against women putting on tefillin and Hollis. And you see, you're getting involved now. The women of the wall, the, 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 they sneak in this great last British Chodesh, they snuck in a little safe for Torah. I don't know, they held it under their apron or something. And they lay in, the women lay in, the, and, and, and they, they, this they're not doing anymore. At one point, they set up a tefillin stand for women to put on tefillin. This is part of the Western world. The Western world is telling us men and women are one and the same. Mark, where do you have it in the headlines here? How are you sitting here now? We're sitting. How am I sitting here now? Because a few hundred thousand young men and women are wearing the garb of the IDF. You understand? I have a, gra- a, gra- a grandson now in officer's training. I have my first career officer grandson. So what's happened? You have a tremendous London and a Balkore and everything else that goes with it. And his wife is at Sadekit. But he's in officer's training right now. Right as we speak. As we speak. No? What's going on with the Tankor? The Mishigayim here. The Western world. Men and women are equal. Did you see the paper, the weekend papers, the research, the army? They're trying to hide it from the public. The tank corps, when women are loading the missiles, I've had many, uh, the, the, the rockets, whatever they're called. What are you calling it? Shells. Shell, shells, no, there's much more to shells when my time, little shells, God, God. Today it's literally rockets, you should see the size. A shell you can load at your age. You're celebrating half a century today. His, he has a wonderful wife. She gave him a birthday gift to come to Israel just to come to Rakefitz to share him Sunday, Monday. I salute, I salute that young lady, Annie. Anyway, coming back here, the, the, the army shows it takes the women twice as long. And, and how do you run an army? What are you running an army for? What is this, a freak show? Without the proper army, we can't sit here. We're finished. But this is the mentality. And you have no idea what a fight is going on. Forget about it, Sneers. You're putting a chayelet and a chayal into one tank? So there's a tremendous outcry. So the new chief of staff, Hatta Bissel Mesechel, than the previous one who was a yeshiva boy who threw it all away. By the way, the head of the, uh, of, of the uh, Kachol Avon, Gans, is Asat Mechosid from the house, from Munkach, Satma, all his relatives are in Kiyad Yoel. Mahabnish Kaimazel, what can we do? 
uh, we fail in Chinuch. There are reasons why. Uh, Mark, men and women are equal. Men and women are equal? Yes, men and women both have a divine soul, but each one represents a different part of the glorious creation. There's a feminine mystique, and there's a masculine gestalt. And this is very serious now, a lot of outcry, because on everything it showed, they couldn't lift it. And when they finally lifted it, it took twice as long to get it into the gun. Okay? And, and uh, this is what they're hitting at. Men and women, equal. Then he asks, uh, how to, again, with Talos and Tfilin, and not in Maritz. Yes, if a woman wants to put on Tfilin, we're not happy about it. It affects the feminine gestalt. Uh, absolutely. Beseda, uh, quietly. No public display. Modestly. What are we talking about here? At the Kotel. And then you have the other part. There's a certain reality to life, which the Supreme Court should learn to consider. The American Supreme Court has learned this. There's a social reality. You're going to have women putting on tefillin at the Kotel and put up a tefillin stand. You have every day thousands upon thousands of Haredim and Chardalim coming to the Kotel. They didn't study in Yeshiva University. They're not broad-minded enough. What are you upsetting the apple cart? A little modesty, sneers. Still a hate. You want a daven, daven. But here, she's showing her lumbus around. It's a miracle she didn't quote the daughters of Rashi here. You know, no, did they put on tefillin? Didn't they put on tefillin? Etc. The maid of Ludmir, the Siddiq Rebbe, uh, Rebetzin, we should say, the, you're aware of that or not, came in Aliyah, Mamish. The bells of Rebetzin of today accepts Kvitlach, Fiatatish, Shirayim. No, where do you stand? They're great women, but there's a certain Gestalt to women. Then they asked her about the Aguna. It's such a painful issue seeing women who are suffering, seeing families who are suffering because they're going through so much turmoil and added stress and tension of Jewish law being structured in the way that it really seems to be against women. Ay, it's the old issue. A man can have 20, 18 wives, we'll say, like a king, and a woman... One husband. There are reasons why, but it's not for now. But look what she says here. Here she claims she's a lamdanit. And here I'm quoting her. The irony is originally when the get idea was orchestrated by the rabbis and the Talmud, it was meant to protect women. But it had the side effect that if a woman refuses to give his wife the get, they are chained. Tell me, did the rabbis invent the get, or is it an open pasuk in the Torah? As far as I know, right in the Varim, Kitaitzeg, open pasuk, katab la sefer kritit, vina tan biyado. And then he asks uh, Rabbi Emanuel Rachman's solution, and where do you stand on that? And Horowitz responds, I think you have to start somewhere and I think it would be a step in the right direction if there was a small group of rabbis sitting on a baton and resolving the problem in the way Rabbi Rachman suggests and of course this is the heart of the issue and in his volume, the author quotes Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik vehemently opposed these reforms. Ignoring this opposition, Rabbi Asher Lopatin, no, who is Rabbi Asher Lopatin? My greatest student from the early 90s in this kollel. Before he came here and studied with us, he carried Rabarin Soloveitchik on his hands. That's how devoted he was to Rabarin, who was crippled already. Lower Lane of Asher Lepatin. Then he becomes president. Now he's, I think, in Detroit. He left the presidency. 
Rabbi Ashula Patton has also called for a supercharged Rachman model. Wow. The audacity of allowing a woman to remarry without a get a halachic divorce which could result in adultery and illegitimate, illegitimate children is no less than breathtaking. And to support such a venture, despite the opposition of recognized Gidole Taurus unsettling, to say the least. And this is the heart of the issue. And then, let me end off this part. They come to the heart of the issue. Jack, you davened this morning. You said in the Shtiblach, Shalo Asani Isha. Nobody is perfect. I don't think your wife is too acceptive. Uh, my wife is very happy that I say it. Oh boy, she's overjoyed. Who needs all your mitzvah, all your wife? God, you know what it means? I don't want to boast, but I don't think I've missed the minion of chakras. Wow. On to 70 years. Minchamarev also pretty close. The only time I missed was in communist Russia when I was in areas where there was no, uh, <coughs> no minion. But when I taught later in the day, I'll tell you, I would say a Karish the Rabbanana and a Barchu. And uh, people came over me and told me it was the first time in their lives they saw someone davening to an unknown to someone they couldn't touch. You gotta remember all over coming, I'll take you on the streets of Moscow, Leningrad, 1980s, on every street there was a getchka. On every house, Lenin's picture. I have, I bought some of the, I have, I have a getchka of Lenin's uh, face in my, I showed it to a good Jew. He thought it was a rabbi because he had a little beard. I said, you're a good Jew, you're done le kapschut. But Lenin, wherever you went, they never, you know, you, you worshiped the communist regime, the communist system, but it was tangible. Right, Yitzchak, right or wrong, the big posters. I, I actually, in the Vakafaran Chelik Daga, I reproduce one of these posters. I think also it could be in Washington, I have one of those posters. Posters, wow. A Jew says, Borchu and bows. So it was something revolutionary for them. Ah, all right. So here, uh, uh, Rabbi Sarah Horowitz, Rabbi Konevsky, a disgrace to say a bracha for not having made me a woman. And Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Ashalo Patton, my dear student, encourages the removal of this blessing. And he gives you the source. Uh, uh, Rabbi Zeb Farber uh, calls the synagogue an all-male club, like the popular cartoon, The Flintstones. How many of you have seen The Flintstones? So that to your children. The Flintstones, what's the club called when they put on those beaver hats? And uh, Strimals, they put on Strimals, and, and, and they have their all-male club. We're in Darala. That's what a shoe is about. Uh, and, and, and here, Rabbi Zeb Farber, women are in a second-class position of women in the synagogue. And, and wow. And here's a woman, Rabbi Maharat Rachel Cole Fingo, class of 2013. She feels that women feel the synagogue is not an inviting place for them. Many women cannot comfortably sing in the musical key chosen by the chazan. You understand that? I don't know. A chazan, musical key. You know, Rivka, if anyone sings, they shoot him on the spot. One, a, a professor from Hebrew, a year at Tzaddik, a Tzaddik is so all married to it. I can tell you their yichas and who they come from. Her father was a Talmud, Muvak of the Chafetz Chaim, and he's a yeshiva shaman. He learned in tells. What a, so one time they were machabarim to Dublin Father Ahmed Shabbos morning, he sang Kel Adon. Yura, he never came back to Old Rifka. <laughs> he sang Kel Adon. Uh, and then, open Orthodox leaders have been in, 
begun introducing new egalitarian reform in the synagogue. For example, the National Synagogue in Washington, D.C. is led by Rabbi Shmuel Hertzfeld, a student of Rabbi Avi Weiss. And he has initiated such reforms as women publicly reading the Megillah in front of men and women, and women serving as the makri for the shofar blowing. And I want to tell you, I was in that shoe. I was in Washington, D.C. I was calling Reza. I had no idea he invited me. I had no idea what it was. An Orthodox shoe. I couldn't believe my ears. It was Shabbos, Mavach, and Rosh Chodesh. And there's a woman had to be in her 90s, you could, barely audible voice. She got up and announced the mullet. You understand? So here it said that was in that shul. And here, Baruch Hashem, Megillah reading. Can a woman be reading Megillah to be, you know how much has been written? All right, to be Motsi women, 90% of the posting would agree. But men, women, is it the same Chiyav, etc.? And Tzniyot, what's going on here? Makri of shofar blowing. Wow. The slippery slope. Finally, I want two kosher aidim. Of course, what I'm going to read here, no one will believe. Uh, Reb David Lifshitz, when he picked aidim under the chuppah, he would say, Zait Mahacher B'tshuva. Picked yeshiva guys, tzaddikim, your father. Could anyone find fault with your father? And Reb David would say to him, Zait Mahacher B'tshuva. Finally, the Jewish wedding is another object of reform. Rabbi Dov Linzer, this is the Rosh Hashiv, always a series of suggestions aimed at making the wedding more egalitarian. This include a kalatish, consisting of the singing and reading of the prenuptial agreement, a bride putting a talis over the groom at the bedeckin. Do you understand what I just read? You have just emasculated the feminine mystic. We cover up the woman's face with a veil. That's beautiful. That's the secret of femininity. The secret of life. The man, the woman, the attraction. All the Gemara, Yoma, Sanhedrin, chicken laying eggs. Cover up the and she should cover up the man's face with his towels. Jack, mm -hmm. please testify that it's written. <laughs> <laughs> and not that. And then the groom circling around the bride under the chuppah. Don't get me started. Big Rosh Yeshiva. World famous London. One of his daughters, Aliyah, married a son of a. His father's no longer alive. I taught with him many years at Talmud of the Chazonishet. Feminists refuse to march around them under the Chuppah. Came up, had to be Masada Kedushin right away. No seven times, period. So, uh, shortly thereafter, I was being a Sadiq edition for a Talmud, and the boys, the Kailo fellas, all asked me, uh, Rebbe, how do you explain that marching under the Chuppah? It's, it's, where is the woman marching? A slave? A shifcha? I said, watch. And I made a little speech. Minag Yisrael, from time immemorial, the kala circles around the chatan. Why? Why is this so vital and so important? Because men by nature are very self-centered. They grow up, they go to yeshiva, they go to slabatka, they learn the musr of the altar of slabatka, 
בשבילי נברא העולם. And a man takes himself very seriously, his achievements, his learning, his Torah, his knowledge. Now he's getting married. And we have to remind him that lady is circling you so that you should know there's someone else in your life now. You can no longer be self-centered. You have to look up and see And this represents the spheres of life, the periods, the commitments, the difficulties, the challenges, the achievements. Your eyes, not only on yourself, but at the lady you are taking to share your life with tonight. And I tell you, everyone was in tears. The men, the women. And then they asked me, Rebbe, is there any source for what you said? No, I didn't have any source for what you said. No, I didn't have any source for what you said. Because you were influenced by the modern world. You've got to read your uh, Rabbi Broy. Are you related by any chance to him? How does it work out? Uh, we, we, we probably are related through my uh, son-in-law, the Samuels. I come from, you know, big I have great grand, uh, grandchildren. Very big Yekesh uh, Yiches. Your sister. All right. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. But uh, you, you talk and don't walk around at all. It says one minute, three times. But he wants the Chatan should mark, w- walk around. Wow. My wife used to say that's the best thing you ever did. The, the best thing that? I never did. <laughs> Okay, can I her, can I her? My wife walked around, no big deal, the rug. But I think when my wife walked around, if I'm not mistaken, and Yitzhak, maybe you can correct me, her mother and father walked with her. Today they walk around only with the women walk, uh, the, the mother, the mother-in-law, right, per se, the whatever way it works out, it works out. But this great rug, his daughter got married and did not walk around at all. And I asked him, I don't want to mention his name because you'll all recognize it. I asked him, uh, Chaim Yankel, my high feminism, and he looked down, feminism, and he looked down. My dear students, we have, we're, we're just, we have more to go, but uh, time is upon us. Um, to reiterate, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming and uh, all those listening.